This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. Camaraderie? Camaraderie. 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 A friendship with them. Uh (laughs) My name's Anthony Padilla and I spent a day with Nicole Byer to uncover the truth about how she's been able to turn her over the top energy that she was once forced to suppress into her massively successful career in stand-up comedy, hosting and acting in some of the most beloved shows on television. And she'll address how her provocative style of comedy has opened the floodgates for some people to assume they can say or do anything to her. Hello, Nicole! Hello! There are lots of different ways to express yourself. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose comedy? What drew you to comedy? When you're on stage or you're acting, you don't have to be you for Mm. that duration of time, and that's sometimes really nice. When my mom died, I think it was in the middle of like my junior year play. Mm. And people were like, oh my God, I can't believe you're at rehearsal. I can't believe it, are you sad? And I'm like, sure I am, but like on stage, I get to be Jenny or whatever the character's mm. name is. I get to step into a different character and deal with what that character is going mm. through. You get a break. Yeah, same thing with doing stand-up or whatever. It's like, this bad thing happened, but I have to get on a plane and I have to go do a show. I brought joy to people and that many more people are happy. Mm-hmm. and I performed and I feel good for that hour, mm-hmm. and then I can step back into you know the bullshit of my life. In high school, my mom was like, you're a very loud person, <laughs> so why don't you go do the play or something where you could be on stage and be loud, mm-hmm. and nobody will interrupt where you. Where it's acceptable. Yeah, that's so it's where it's accepted. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I said, all right. So oh. I auditioned for the play, got a call back. I was so excited. I was like, she's an actor. People would laugh while we rehearsed it. And then the night that we performed it, I said my first joke and there was like an eruption of like laughter. And I was like, I feel powerful. <laughs> I feel like, who's that man with the rings in Marvel? Thanos. I'm Thanos and mm-hmm. I've collected all the f- blood diamonds. What are they? No. The, blood the, diamonds the, is right. The infinity yeah. stones. <laughs> I feel like I'm like chasing the high. Like I'm chasing the mm. high of like that first laugh. Like, does that mean that it does feel like an addiction? I don't want to be like addiction is the same as like doing comedy, but like you have to be like a little addicted or like deranged mm. to leave your home at night, drive 40 minutes to go to another dark place and like try to make people laugh. That's an illness. At 8.30, I'm boarding up all my windows. Yes, everyone is. They're like, no, buddy, come in. But like, I I love doing it. I'm trying to give them joy, and then the joy manifests and laughs, and they give that to me. Mm. So then I'm like, yes, okay, you like this. I'm going to give you more of that. Mm. Even bad sets, sometimes I'm just like, I'm going to give you more as a punishment for not liking me. (laughs) Just no one's laughing yeah. and you're just yeah, still up there like, doing your thing. I'll give you more of what you hate. I posted on my community tab that I was going to be interviewing the Nicole Byer. Mm-hmm. And a standout thing that people were pointing out, she has so much <laughs> energy. How does she always have a smile on her face? I was once asked that by a kid at this thing. He was like, do you like go home and like die at night? I just like choose to smile. Cause like, if you really think about it, if you like walk around all day and you're like, I'm this. Yeah. Like that's like, that's hard. Do you want to be a hateful, bitter bitch? or like a smiling little dummy who's having a nice time. And I understand that there's a lot of stuff out of my control. Mm -hmm. Like more than I care to admit is fully out of my control. Mm -hmm. But then I also like, I do think there's power in like, oh my God, this doesn't sound so hippy dippy. Magical thinking and manifesting. Manifesting, it's like sitting at home going, I want it. Like, I I really think there's something to it. You mentioned that you have ADHD. Sure do. Do you think that contributes to your comedy? Oh, I absolutely think it contributes to my comedy because people are like, you're annoying or you're this, you're that or whatever. But I'm like, but that's what makes me me. Mm. I'm a flighty, spacey, talkative little dummy (laughs) and it's made me a lot of money. (laughs) So like, that's nice. I've seen you a few times. I've been uh-huh. to a couple of your stand-up shows and one that stands out to me, <laughs> it, it will not leave my psyche. The moment you got on stage, <laughs> you started getting heckled within three seconds flat yeah. and your entire set became about the heckler because they just would not leave. I'll never forget it. She was like, I'm not poor. 
I don't clean houses. I spent all my money at dinner tonight and I didn't have any wine. And I was like, I feel like you did. And she's like, no, I didn't. She was like telling me all this stuff. And it was as if she didn't see an audience. She was the only she person She was there. like, this bitch. <laughs> yeah. I have things to say to this bitch. People want to tell me things and I don't know why. You just have this inviting aura. I do think having a round face makes you look friendlier. You handled that ridiculous situation mm. with such grace. I'm not an idiot. Nothing I wrote would be funnier than her. I did a show in Irvine where this girl, I told a joke about this white woman who interrupted my set and I was like, there's nothing powerful, more powerful than a white woman with a birthday. And then this lady was like, it's my birthday and I'm black. And I was like, are you trying to prove that black people could be just as annoying? And she said, yes. And we had like a, a lovely back and forth that was very funny. And then towards the end, I was like, all right, shut up now. And the audience was like, oh. and I was like, oh, great. Someone who said, I'm trying to yes. annoy you. Yes. And you said, stop. Yes. And they said, how dare you? That's not yes. professional. And that's like a thing with comedy. You have to like figure out how to interact with the heckler. You either like shut him down or you like have a playful moment. But then getting out of it is so hard. What was your childhood like? It was good. No, uh, <laughs> 100% good. I'm a child of affirmative action. Affirmative action is companies had incentives to uh, include people, to include more diversity in uh, their employee group. We're gonna hire 20 people. Out of 20 people, five of them have to be non-white people. Mm. My dad had two degrees. So like right. my dad was more than capable of doing the job he was hired to do, mm. but he may not have been looked for unless there was an incentive for the company to go out mm -hmm. and find black people. You tend to interview people and gravitate towards the people you identify with, the people you understand. Mm. So if you are interviewing a black person who comes from a different socioeconomic background, you may not understand them. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, they just didn't vibe with me. They didn't mm -hmm. click. So. No, pass. Even though they are more than capable of doing the job, mm -hmm. you just didn't find a camaraderie. Camaraderie? Camaraderie. Camaraderie. A friendship with them. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was an incentive to hire black people, so my dad was hired, mm. and my dad was able to you know, give me and my sister generational wealth, which is not a thing a lot of black mm. people are afforded. We grew up in like an all white neighborhood. So like growing up, I knew I was different. I knew I was another, but I didn't really think too much about it because mm. yeah, she's this round faced idiot <laughs> skipping around, having a nice time. Yeah. And then, you know, you grow up and you're like, oh, there were a lot of microaggressions mm. and a lot of macroaggressions mm. that happened. It shaped who I am. And it is interesting to then grow up and then go to auditions where people are like, be blacker and you're you're like, oh, but I am black. And what does that even mean? Because black means something different to every yeah, single it's, person it's who is black. It's not a monolith or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like growing up like that did inform who I am now. How much did your childhood influence your sense of humor? My mom was a very funny person. My grandmother, when I was little, she would be like, oh, you you tickle me, which is not a thing people say here. It's, and I loved hearing that. So I would try to like get her to say it a lot. Yeah. Because it just made me feel, it was just so funny. It was like, you tickle me. And I'm like, I'm not though. I truly loved hearing that. It was just like a treat for my ears. How do you think your grandma would feel knowing that? That shaped your entire you. I'm pretty sure she'd be like, that's nice. You're gonna go back to school. <laughs> She literally asked me like two years ago, she's like, are you gonna go get your degree anytime like soon? Like be productive. Yeah, and I was like, bitch, I bought a house. Like, I'm okay. That was like a huge thing in my family. They were like, don't you want a degree? And I was yeah. like, I have a certificate that says I can act. They've had it instilled within them that a degree is the only way to yes. really like know that you're, you're yeah. set. I've been working a long time. This is the first year that like, my whole family's like, oh, she's an actor. Because oh. <laughs> I'm on a network show. Oh. So that's like what's very accessible to my family. Yeah. Like I saw my aunts the other day and they were like, you're very funny on it. We watch it every week. And I was like, you do? And then my cousin's like, yeah, I won't let them watch your stand up though. And that made me laugh so hard. It'd be a little too much. Yeah. A little, a little too little X-rated. Too much, yeah. When did you first start gaining recognition in the comedy sphere? So I think my very first job was 30 Rock, which mm. if you blink, you miss me. I tell everybody, and my grandmother, she did say, she was like, this is what you were excited You're for. Like, ah. But the very first thing that like really got me notoriety was Girl Code on MTV. I'll forever be grateful for that because yeah. that was a show where we weren't censored. We got to say exactly what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Granted, I did not understand what the show was. And then the third time they flew me out to New York, I was like, how many episodes am I doing? They're like, all of them. And I was like, oh, 
Okay. It's funny. If you want to kill an actor, just like tell them to come to a location. They'll come. Cause like I would just get on planes and like somebody would just pick me up at the airport. I never ask. Just a like question. wandering around, yeah, not knowing like, what's happening. Okay. Um, and get to the hotel and be like, "Do you have a room for me?" And they're like, "Yeah." yeah. You're like, yeah. "Okay, cool." I did a commercial where they were like, "Meet us on 59th and 10th," and I was like, "Okay." And there was a big white van. Yeah. And I was like, "Is this the van to the commercial?" And they're like, "Mm-hmm." Did they put a bag on your head and throw you in? They did. Oh. And then yeah. they hit me. No, I'm kidding. There was also like a couple other actors in there, and as we were driving upstate, I was like, did any of you ask any other questions? And they're like, no. <laughs> we're actors, we do what we're told. Kind of, you just do it. Did you have any struggles leading up to that? Where so I was with this other manager, and he asked me to put a tape together for Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23. I'll never oh. forget, that was the first audition, like television audition I had gotten. We watched it back and I was like, I am funny. Uh. <laughs> ABC's gonna want me. And then I uh, sent the tape to my manager and he was like, God, Nicole, you're so broad in this. Like, I know this, this is good for the stage, but like, this isn't good for TV. And I was like, hey, nobody told me there was a difference. So like, you were doing like theater yeah, acting? Like very funny on stage, but like on television, you'd be like, this person is sick. With like a close up <laughs> yeah. shot on your face. And you're like, ah! <laughs> it's like, she's unwell. And then I actually got called in and I cannot remember the casting director's name, but she had like quotes all over, just like printed on paper. It was yeah. very like zenny and I mm. felt very calm. Went into the room, we did the scene and then she goes, okay. Do people tell you you're too much? And I said, yes all the time. Mm -hmm. On this, they said I was too much, but then you called me in and she's like, yeah, I called you in because you're like at a 10, uh -huh. I can work with that. Uh -huh. I can bring you down to a six, I can bring you down to a four. Yeah. Some people you can't bring past a two. So then we like worked on a tape, we worked on audition. I was, and then I was like, oh, okay, so that's how you put a tape together. Uh -huh. That's how you act on camera. And then I just never forgot those words. So like when I would go to auditions, I would go do a little bit more than I thought they wanted. Uh. And then they would bring me down. There was never a question as to like, can she go <laughs> bigger? You could go to 11, yeah. 12, 13. I could mm. blow the roof off uh -huh. this bitch if you want. I'm so happy I heard that so early in my career uh -huh. because I would spend a lot of time trying to adjust to like what people want as opposed to being like, this is who I am. Mm. This is how I interpret the character. Yeah. If that's not how you feel, tell me. Sounds like this is another instance in your life where you thought doing what felt right to you mm -hmm. was not right. And yeah. then you realize, oh wait, it is okay to just be me. Yes, absolutely. Because if I had listened to my manager, I don't know where I'd be. You're not just a comedian. No. You're an Emmy nominated TV host, writer, actress, producer, and host of four different podcasts. You've been on BoJack Horseman, Family yes. Guy, The Simpsons, Rugrats, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and so many other beloved shows. I've just been like really f lucky. Like it's, it's more than luck though. It is more than luck, but it's also being at the right place at the right time. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm the most talented person in the world. It's a combination of a couple yeah. things. Yeah, to be a little friendly, you know, yeah. nice to work <laughs> with. I feel like your entire career is something that most people would be so excited about. Like, mm. I would feel I made it. Do you feel like you've made it? No. <laughs> Why not? But if you are a curious person who is curious about expanding your mind, you'll be excited to know that this episode is sponsored by Babbel. Now, thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. So whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or you just have some free time, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. Their speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and your accent, and you could choose from 14 different languages including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. I went with French, je t'aime. You can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes, depending on whichever learning method suits you most. And it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Guarantee? Guarantee with no D. Right now, save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash Padilla. That's babbel.com slash Padilla for up to 60% off your subscription. Now, back to the world of Nicole Byer. Do you feel like you've made it? No. <laughs> Why not? I was doing Seth Meyers and I was walking in and there was like a ton of paparazzi because I'm like, yeah. two of them were like, I guess I'll take a picture of her. And then this little boy was like, mama, who is that? And then his mother goes, that's a person? <laughs> Every couple yeah. of days, someone's like, hey, you ain't shit. I think I've accomplished yeah. a lot. I don't want to yeah. negate things that I've done because uh -huh. I'm very proud of them. I'll know I made it when I'm 90 years old <laughs> and like people are like, 
I know you're dying, but like, remember this funny thing you did? <laughs> so you won't know you made it for another 55 years? I mean, this is like a morbid thought, but like, I don't think you've made it till you've made a legacy. Mm. I don't think you've made it until like, you're gone and people are like, oh no. Mm. And that's not to say I don't allow myself to like be excited and like proud yeah. of my shit. Yeah. But like, there's just so much more that I want to do. Mm -hmm. So no, I haven't made it. Does that mean that you're not satisfied until then? Ooh, that's, oh my God, Anthony. Mm. Sorry, I didn't know I was gonna be getting so deep today. I know, I know, I know. You're making me squeak. <laughs> um, no, I probably will never be satisfied, which is like a sad thing to say. It's one of those things where like, I'll celebrate something that I get but not too hard because it's not airing yet. So I don't celebrate till it airs. Then you get into like, will it get renewed? Like yeah. what's gonna happen with it? There's always something new to worry yeah. about. Yeah, so it's like, I don't necessarily let myself relax. Did it make you feel less pressure to like get to the top to be like, oh, this is just where it is? I don't know if there's a top per se that I'm trying to get to. Mm. I think what I'm trying to do is like make the funniest shit possible with my friends to make a room full of people laugh. I read that your commentary and nailed it, the baking show, gets edited down quite a bit so that it can, uh, you know, create that that feel good, G-rated comedy that the show is known for. I mean, we shoot for like 12, 15 hours a day. Uh -huh. Cause like when I go two hours on the clock, start baking. Yeah. I am sitting there for two hours watching them bake. That's so funny. Cause when I was watching, I was like, there is no way she's actually sitting there for that long. She goes off, she does something else. She comes back, no. gets a joke in. No, you were there I for two am there for two hours, hours watching someone bake. Yes. And there's, after you're like the kicks in the oven. I don't want to say it's not fun. I will say if I could concentrate on watching someone bake a cake for two hours, uh -huh. there's something wrong with me. <laughs> I can't say to someone's grandma, your buttercream looks like jizz. Uh -huh. Like they're not going to keep that in. I'm sure that. X rated nailed it would have a very big audience. Different audience. Yeah. But a big audience. Yeah. Girthy yeah. audience. I said a very girthy audience. I said <laughs> something that Jacques loved. Did it have to do with penises or Yeah, gears? of course it did. Okay. I put something blue in my mouth, a blue food coloring. Mm. And he was like, don't put that in your mouth, Nicole. Your mouth's going to be really blue. Mm. And I turned around. I was like, does it look like a blue cookie monster? Mm. And he was like, no. <laughs> what has been your most bizarre fan encounter? I do talk a lot about like my personal life. There's always like a chubby lady and her very thin husband. And they're like, do you want to have a threesome? Oh. And I'm like, no. Why do they no. assume that you'd want to? I think it's because I'm like, I'm horny for I'll do anything. Give me yum, uh. yum, yum, yum. And people are like, I can satiate you. And I'm like, I don't want it. Mm. Like, sure, yes, I want to be in a relationship. But I'm also joking about how thirsty I am for one. Yeah. And then I think people don't understand that the lines are mm. like, like they, they blur it a little mm. bit. You're working on so many projects right now. What is your favorite one that you're working on right now? Got to work on this um, show called Grand Crew on NBC. One of my really good friends, Phil Augusta Jackson, created it. All the guest stars we had, all of the characters who have like one line, were all incredible, wonderful people. This show has so much heart. Yes. And humor. Yes. It feels like you really are just watching a close group of friends live their life. And I got this sense of like, Oh, the world is okay. I don't know oh. why it was like this comforting feeling, even I though there were that. conflict. A lot of the comedy that I see today is about like, that thing sucks. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, Grand Crew is very like friendly, nice. Yeah, uh, it's we feel genuinely good. love each other. Yeah. Um, you feel that when you watch it. Yeah. What are some things that you hope people take away from this show? It is an all black cast. Mm. So I feel like people have tried to pigeonhole us as a black show. There's black people on the show. Mm. Is Friends a white show? No, that's not how you would it's describe that show. show. It's a show. The norm is white. Anything mm. else is like, oh, that's a black show. That's a that's an Asian show. That's like, yeah. da, 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 da. and you're just like, mm. what, why? Why is it like that? Why is white the norm? It's a show for everybody. I think we deal with a lot of issues that like a lot of people deal with. And I don't think it's like just a race thing. I think it's yeah. just a pure comedy. I think yeah. it's just funny. I very rarely watch like a white show and I'm like, oh boy, this wasn't for me. Them uh, whites were too white. <laughs> they was white and everywhere. You know what I'm saying? They had white problems. Yeah. They talked about white things. They spoke in a white way. 
I've I don't never, understand it. I've never thought I needed closed captioning on. <laughs> yeah, and I, like, I don't get it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so weird to me that like people wouldn't watch something because they're like, oh, that's not for me. When you auditioned for Wipeout, did you already know that John Cena was your co-host? I'd also like to thank Honey for their continued support in sponsoring this series. Honey is the easy way to save when you're shopping on your iPhone or your computer. It's a browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one that it finds to your cart so you no longer have to stare at that empty void of a discount code box because if Honey finds a working coupon, a little Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupon. Hey, listen, because Honey supports over 30,000 stores online ranging from tech to popular fashion brands and food delivery and has personally saved me a ton of money, including the very fashionable articles of clothing that I'm wearing underneath my pants that I refuse to show you because it would maybe, it probably it would get this video age gated and we don't want that now, do we? Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it also works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari, on your phone, and save on the go. It's free and it installs in just a few seconds, so if you want to do yourself a solid and also support this series, get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Padilla. Again, it's free, and I'm only gonna say this once more, so listen up, okay? It's joinhoney.com slash Padilla, and you'll be directly supporting this series. Now, back to the world of Nicole Byer. Yes, they said that John Cena was hosting and that they were looking for a co-host. And I was like, but why me? Uh -huh. I was like, he's very famous. Yeah. This is crazy. It was just truly wild. Like he's charismatic. He smells really good. Important. He's like really kind. Mm -hmm. Also smart. Not that I, oh my God, that sounds like <laughs> I didn't think he was smart. I just wasn't super familiar with like WWE and his whole persona. I had said something to him about how I hate it when people yelled, nailed it at me. Oh. And I was like, don't you get tired of people like rapping your intro to you or yeah. saying, you, I can't see you or you yeah. can't see me. And he was like, what? No. <laughs> and I was like, no. He was like, no, Nicole. That's how people want to connect with me. They don't know me. That's what I've given them to know about me. Mm -hmm. So when they say it back to me, they're just looking for a connection because they like what I do. So why not be proud of what you do? That's... And I was like, John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about doing what you do that brings you the most joy? So I wrote a book and I say the term wrote loosely. It's a lot of pictures. Oh, okay, uh, it's a graphic novel. I wouldn't even go that far. Okay, I'll take the word book. novel out of that. <laughs> Picture book. It's truly just a bunch of pictures of me in bikinis, mm -hmm. but like women will come up to me who are also bigger, or larger or whatever, and they're just like, that book really just changed my outlook on how I look at myself. And now I'm like, oh, why wear a cardigan in the summer? Like my fat arms aren't gonna kill anybody. Mm -hmm. If someone has something to say about your body to your face, you are powerful because you changed their life. They had to stop what they were doing to say something to you. Because when you don't care about something, yeah. do you feel any need to talk about stuff you don't care about? Sure don't. Do you feel any comments about the corner of that wall? Sure don't. Do not give a shit about that. No, I don't really care. I'm just really <laughs> blessed and happy that the ceiling's up there. It really is a reflection of that person. Yeah, like something's going on with them where they can't go on their day. Like they can't. I just think we should all understand that all bodies are different. All of them are beautiful. People assume that certain body types are not healthy depending on just the visual aspect yeah. of it and that you can't be as active if it's a certain way. A lot of people in the comments when I posted I was gonna be interviewing her was like, have her talk about her pole dancing, she pole dances. People love hearing about that. Which is funny, cause I'm not good at it. <laughs> but I'm like, let's normalize hobbies that you're not perfect at. True. I have so much fun doing it. People feel like I only wanna do this thing if I'm good at it. Oh, I wish I would've gotten good at it when I was a kid and there was no yeah. pressure so I could just do it now and be good. And you can't expect like, to be good every... immediately. Yeah, right? no, you gotta work a little bit mm -hmm. at it. I like doing it and it brings me joy. So like, mm -hmm. I'll do it until it doesn't bring me joy. Mm -hmm. I spent a day with Nicole Byer. And one thing that really sits with me is her choice to be a smiling little dummy in all facets of her life. And not with a sense of suppression, but as a challenge to find the fun in every breath. What could our lives look like if we saw life as a constant game of finding joy in every moment? Are you ever on a plane and you go, if we all stop believing, this will crash? <laughs> if we all stop believing? I know, I understand like aerodynamics or whatever, yeah, but like I truly think it's a little bit of magic and oh. I think it's we all have so to So because believe. we all believe it will fly, that's the only reason it's in the air. It's wild. And truly I was just sitting there, I'm like, 
What if every single person just goes, this isn't real? And it's like, this isn't real. It's like, will we go to Emergency! We all stopped believing this flight could fly! 